Diagwed everyone, Kojima Tashi, and welcome back to episode number 66 of the Inline G Flute Podcast with me, your host, motherfucking Inline G. Oh lads, autumn is back, it makes me very happy. That malevolent September sun has fucked off with its tail between its legs and that lovely crisp October gaze has replaced it. It's lovely, it's the kind of weather where you go outside the pub at night for a quick cigarette or a vape and that, that lovely crisp cold air just hits you in your rosy cheeks. But this week's episode has actually been locked up in the engine inline G vault since August, I think, we recorded this. So it's still got that little tinge of summer optimism throughout. Now, we've got another guest this week, but first, we have a few firsts. Number one, this is the first time we have had a guest come back to the podcast. She appeared twice on the podcast. I'm very excited about that. And number two, it is the first episode that has zero script whatsoever. We are freewheeling the ass out of this. So you'll see from the title that the spectacularly wicked Gary Shocker is back on the podcast. He was the first big flute superstar to appear 49 episodes ago, almost a year, way back in episode 18. Now the podcast has grown a lot since then and I actually think Gary coming on has a lot to do with that. He was the first big superstar to take the plunge that so many have taken since then. Now, in that last episode, Gary talked about his compositional process a little bit and how sometimes he can write a piece of music in under an hour. And you would have remembered my wee shocked face at the time. We've chatted a lot since then and we had an idea. Well, Gary had the idea. It's all Gary this now. Gary's going to compose a piece of flute music live on air from scratch and walk us through the process. Now, I wasn't sure if this would work out. There was a few challenges, especially audio quality, but we got there in the end and the episode actually turned out to be a really good one. So, you're going to watch as Gary takes a very well-known flute theme and turns it into a completely finished work live on air. It's amazing. And then after that, we chat the usual shite. We chat about Charlie XCX and Demure and all those things. Really. So, stick around at the very end because at the very end, there is a video of the completed composition. Composition. The completed thing, the whole thing recorded by Mr. Shocker himself on flute and piano in high quality. It's beautiful. You can hear the entire thing at the end. Gary's been very kind to let me have that. And there's a score. Okay, so if you want to get the music, I'm going to put a link in the description to download it. If you can't find the link, just send me a message and I'll send it to you. I'd be delighted to. It's beautiful. You should get the score. Get the score and listen to the piece on its own with the score. Follow along. It's fucking class. It's called uh, Sunday in Cologne. Just, ah, oh, trust me in this, lads. You have to listen. It's a fucking belter piece. How cool is it that we're getting a, compo- a composition from the world's leading and most prolific flute composer alive today on this podcast, just for this podcast. It's like a theme tune. It's amazing. I suppose he's rotten on here. Now, it's a great episode. Uh, regular listeners, you skip ahead. You know what to do. Uh, if you're new around here, just bear with me for a moment. The Inline G podcast is free and always will be free. However, if you want to donate to the podcast, you can now do so through the Patreon on the screen. Now is the address, and for the audio listeners, it is patreon.com forward slash the Inline G Flute Podcast. It costs five euros a month or whatever that is in your currency, and with that, you're genuinely keeping this podcast alive. You get an episode every Friday of this podcast. Come rain nor fucking shine, I will always turn up, and I do everything around here on my own is the definition of an independent podcast if you listen to all those episodes and you think fuck it buy gareth a pint to say thank you you can do it virtually away you go also you are uh supporting my podcast you're supporting my art you're paying me for my work as an artist which feels incredible in the modern world to get paid for my work and most importantly it allows me to stay away from sponsors because you, the listener, is paying for this podcast, not sponsors. So I can tell sponsors to go fuck themselves when they come along and say, oh, we'd love to do an episode, but can you not swear? Can you not talk about mental health? Can you not talk about the people who are accused of certain things? Blah, blah, blah. They can go fuck themselves. I can talk about whatever I want because you're paying for it, not a sponsor. So if you can afford it, please go sign up over there. It means the world to me and it is really needed at the minute. I do need the sponsor. I need the Patreon money, okay? Because I've got big projects coming up and I need to be able to pay for them. So it really is very appreciative if you can sign up over there. Listen, when you jump in to sign up, you can jump out at any time. There's no weird fees, no weird subscriptions. I do it with a load of podcasts myself. One month I can't pay it, I just jump out. No cost, no weirdness, okay? If you can afford to, it's hugely appreciated. It's only a five a month, lads. It's a pint, okay? It's not much. If you can afford to, but if you can't afford to, I know it's tough times, okay? I really do. And a fiver a month can be a lot to some people. There's a cost of living crisis. We're all artists, or a lot of us are. If you can't pay it, that's fine. You can keep listening for free. You'll get all the episodes. Someone else is paying so you can listen. And lastly, quickly, don't forget to check out the merchandise, lads. Check out the fucking Inline G merchandise. I'll do an episode on this soon on flute fashion. I'm already writing it. But 
T-shirts, tote bags, stickers, designed by Belfast designer Grant. They're fucking gorgeous. They're so cool. The idea was I wanted merchandise that you could wear to the practice room and you could wear to the club. These are really, really nice T-shirts. Really nice tote bags. Go check them out. Links in the description. You can go to my website for it, garethewson.com, or go to my socials and you'll find links to all the stuff there. They're great. They're high quality. They're beautiful. I'm so happy with them. Go fucking buy them. I should be wearing one now, but I'm not. I'm wearing a 2007 Celtic top with Shinsuke Nakamura on the back when he scored that free kick against United at Old Trafford. And the Americans will have just heard a foreign language there. Fuck you guys. Anyway, uh, here is this week's episode with Inline G Hall of Famer and Compositional Mastermind, Gary Shocker. Okay, well, yeah. anyway, let's get to today. Two things today. First of all, two things I noticed just before we recorded. Two firsts on the podcast. One, this is the first time I've ever went into an episode with zero script, zero preparation. We're just going with this today, which I'm so excited for. It feels very freeing for the first time to do this. And two, you're the first guest to appear twice on the NNG podcast. You're the first one. Cool. Is that because of my split personality? Yes. Okay. <laughs> no, Great. it's not. But we had this. I don't know if we actually said on air in the first episode that we were going to do this someday, or if we said off air, because we talked for quite a while off air. But anyway, the idea we had at some point was you. Were, I think we had brought up one of your younger operas you'd written, and you had said you'd written the opera in a couple of days. And I was like, You've written a couple of days? And you were like, Yeah, I've written pieces in shorter time than that. And I was like, How long could you write a piece? And you said, Yeah, I can write a piece in under an hour. And I was like, Well, that's a great idea for a podcast and here we are i want to i want to see this process so the idea behind today is just to see what we can do in an hour and watch your watch your compositional mind go and to be honest i'm just going to sit back and enjoy the ride and ask questions like a big child i mean one thing i could do for example i could take um like a classic flute piece I have to stop squinting. I'm going to put my glasses on so I can see. I, like a classic flute piece and take some part of it and then turn it into something else, in which case you that... could choose a, a piece for me and then I could do that. Yes, Joe, you know that, that's a spot on <laughs> idea. And I actually think I have, I, have, I have one straight away in my mind. Straight okay, away. What I is that? What because... is, and I hope I know it. Oh, you will. So in the first movement of the Mozart G major concerto, you yeah. have the little... The B minor section, just e minor. after the um, E minor. Yeah, that's what I said. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, that little melody. There you are. That. Yeah. Okay. So, what would that. you? Let's tell me. Tell me. Walk, walk me through. What are you thinking? What's the early idea? Uh I could turn that into a piece with the flute and the piano. So, uh -huh. um, oh, here we go. So, I always use both instruments when I when I compose because okay. you know Clearly. things that sound good on the piano don't necessarily sound good on the flute, okay. as evidenced by so much bad flute music there it is out there. You know, it's like oh, you know, I know it's, very well. You know, <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> So, I would probably start, I would probably do something like that. And what are you writing down at the minute? Are you writing down full notes, chords, or what have you got? Okay. The music. Okay. Da -de -dum -de -dum. Ba -de -dum. I should have put it, damn it, I hate putting in the key signature i think that's part of me that doesn't like being told what to do oh you told me this last time you said you wrote a lot of your stuff without key signatures and then you put it in afterwards is that right yeah okay yeah, so here's a tune i can go with go Two, three, four, five, die, Screw you, I'm just going to write this piece. <laughs> I, uh, 
I want to know what you're saying. Oh, good to you. What, what you're happy about? I want to know what's going on here. Well, it's making sense to me. Da, 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 okay. Da, it's, it's got an emotional, uh, uh, it's got an emotional something. That's good. That rest is good. So then what I'm doing here is I'm trying to make sure the piano is just not sitting there. You know, it's part of the active conversation. Okay, so I have a seven bar opening here. Okay. Surprise. Oh, I like that better. A flat on the bottom. I'll have to figure out what I want there. I'm not quite sure in that bar. I want the piano to take some portion of the opening flute bar and turn it into something a little bit different before I go back and restate or go to another key with it. Okay. Okay. So okay. that's how I do it. Okay. So you've got, you said a, a seven bar opening, opening phrase. Yes. Okay. Is that something you think of straight away? Because in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, classical no, composition. No, I'm not, four I'm bar, not measuring. No, no, no. I'm not. It's just the way it turned out. It's because I put a little bit of a, probably because I put that strange sudden stop uh-huh. And uh, see, I, uh, do you want me to play it again or do you yes. already have that? Yeah, play it for you. Okay, well, here's the flute part. Yes. Sorry, I'm getting off camera here. Oh, don't worry, we'll pick it up. So that's the tune. Oh, that's good. Yeah, so I'm going to just take the. That's just the, the first three notes, but then I went somewhere more positive and happy up with it. Yeah, so that's confirmed that we're going to a major key there, aren't we? Yes, we are. We're going into A flat. Yeah, I could do the same idea where I could do a a break on the second beat there, put a a, a rest because it it stops, it shocks, it stops yeah. people. You know, you know, like when I get stuck. I mean, I don't do it so much now, but when I would compose a lot, I would if I just didn't quite know what I was wanting, I would I would always pay attention to Haydn. Okay. Because Haydn always has these weird little, like, I mean, Beethoven, of course, you know, everything is just reworked and reworked and reworked yeah. and reworked. Yeah. But Haydn is is more shocking in a way uh, at times. He just does these, I mean, you know, he's famous for all of those things, you know, the surprise symphony and well, all that. The symphony is the one that comes to mind, yeah. But in his in his piano sonatas, and there's plenty of them, and I've played most of them, yeah. they they often just go somewhere so a wall <laughs> and it's tonality just fun. wise yeah tonality or rhythmically or uh, okay. he'll do a gesture and you know when i was um when i was studying because i taught myself how to compose i didn't study composing with anybody but i did when i was at school my uh i had my second flute teacher was um very big on analyzing everything musically. Okay. Um, sadly, when he went to play it, it would sound so terrible that I just didn't want to do what he said. But yeah. actually, his his mind was spot on yeah. about what was happening in the music. You know, like, oh, there's a sequence, and he'd get all sweaty describing this sequence, and then you do this, and then he'd pick it up, and it was like, oh, please, if, I, if I'm going to sound like that, I'm not going to do these things. But then I realized after a while, no, he's right. And it's good, you know, Schenkerian analysis, when you, you know, when you look at Beethoven and you just kind of, well, where is this kernel going, you know? Yeah. And it's very, very helpful. Like something like um, 
I'm just going to be all over the place today as usual. I love this. You yeah. Know, the, you know, Poulenc Sonata, people don't hear. That's the phrase, you know. The other stuff is ornamentation, the little. Da, 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 yeah. Da, 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 da. Yeah. It's so sad. And talk about manic. <laughs> yeah. You know, talking about going in the opposite direction. But when you start to understand what, you know, what makes a piece work, you know, what uh -huh. makes it or really, really, what what makes it beautiful? What are the surprises? What are the unexpected things that make you listen and say, "Oh, I've never heard that before." It's like if you see a flower you've never seen before, you're going to get a lot more excited than if you look at a another yeah. red geranium. Yeah. Well, the Nothing red geraniums can be very pretty. They they are, but do you know what I'm saying? It's like I do. It's it's like same with physical beauty. If you see somebody that's so beautiful, it's not because they look like everybody else. It's because There's they're unique, yeah. so uniquely beautiful themselves. Yeah, like yourself. Yeah. I was just about to say you took the words right out of my mouth there, Gary. I, was about to I say, mean, it, two perfect examples sitting here. There you go. Look at us just sitting here. Oh shit. Oh, oh wow. wow! That is going to look <laughs> great on camera. One second. Oh, man, that is going to look pick so it up, good. pick it up, pick it up. <laughs> okay, we're. Are you all okay, right? We're I, I'm you didn't fine. break anything, did you? No, I'm totally fine. The okay. camera fell. I'm fine. <laughs> okay, that'll good. look great on camera. Um, no, what I wanted to ask as well was then. So even the way you're analyzing the Poulenc, the opening, the opening melody of the Poulenc sonata, um, is that something that you would do when you're composing? So you would get an idea of a theme. Would you ever go back to your theme and say, right, I'm going to jazz this up a bit. I'm going to ornament. I'm going to add other things. Or does it come out ready to go? No, only if when I play it back, if it feels dull. Uh, okay. If there's something that feels dull, it's like, Oh, I need a trill or I need okay. a different articulation. I need something that's going to make it more <laughs> special. Yeah. But, you know, you can't really doll things up when you come. I mean, you can, but I don't work that way. I, I'm, yeah. I mean, I think what makes a piece beautiful essentially is the, um, again, just like a person beautiful, the uniqueness of it. Like, yeah. How can something that is recognizably melodically, you know, recognizably melodic, still be beautiful after so many millions of melodies have been written. Wow, that's the point. Yeah, oh, I'm fascinated by where you're going to go with this. Okay, so well, let's go back to the composition itself then. So you've got your first section essentially. Now, where would you go next if you wanted to turn this in? Like again, I'm if I was composing, this is probably why I'm not a composer. If I was composing, I'd say I've got my X amount of bars. I'm going to now. That's my uh, what do you call it? Exposition. Okay? And I've got my recap as well. I'd probably write a recap and I'd probably mess about with it and then I would write the middle section. I would structure it very clearly in my head. Are you oh, doing I that? Or is it... No, not at all. I'm all okay. like following my in... I just follow my instincts. Okay. I'm so curious to see where it goes. And so, what's... where would you go next? So, I'm just taking, again, I'm taking those first three notes of the Mozart which I put in F minor instead of... Uh... He was in yeah. E minor, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah, there we go. So now I can turn that melody, ID, melodic ID, uh, into something the flute's going to do. Okay, so then we're back in 4-4. Four, four. Oh, this is going to be good. I'm surprised I can do this because I've never really done this. I, th I take your word for it. <laughs> okay, so it's a contrasting theme. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I'm just because I hate being boring, but I can't help it because I no, can write be boring, down. be boring. There's nothing boring about it, but. 
Oh, so this is in 3, 2. All right. So that's not a bar line. That's a continuation. <laughs> you know, sometimes when you watch a depiction of a composer, it's just so ridiculous. For example, um, somebody trying to find the right note for a phrase, and mm -hmm. then they just, like, they'll just, like, keep, randomly pushing notes down <laughs> until the and, right one pops up <laughs> yeah and it doesn't work that way because it has to happen uh it's like that um uh well i'm 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 comparing it to that shakespeare quote you know the fault is not in the stars but in ourselves the yep. idea is not in the piano it's not in the instrument that yeah, you're, you're playing the idea is there. inside you so you don't make a noise until you have something to say that's why oh. I don't really believe in like noodling around on the piano to try to find a piece. Yeah, that's what I'm I discovering as well. Play a play a bunch of notes and think that I'm going to get you know anywhere out of it. I mean, I might occasionally I'll hit a weird interval and I'll think, oh, that's interesting. Maybe I can use that. But that's like two notes. I'm not okay. going to like. I'm not going to you know play. Uh, just like improvise and think it's going to become music because it doesn't for me. Okay, but then on that note, there's a couple of times when you're writing where you'll you play something and you go, that's it, got it. Is that in your head first and then your got it moment is confirming that that's what it sounds I like? I think so. I think that, you know, our synapses and everything's already just moving really quickly that's... and you may not feel it or sense it, but it's there. Just like when a tune pops into your head, well, where does it come from? I mean, Mozart famously made some remarks about he loved it when people were practicing all around him because he got lots of ideas. Oh, I haven't heard and, that one. Oh, yeah. And I mean, you know, when <laughs> I first started to try to write music as an adult, first of all, um, well, not an adult even, but as a teenager, I mean, everybody mm -hmm. uh, was writing such stuff that didn't interest me. I didn't want to listen to it. And I just thought, well, I can't write music because I don't I, How am I going to write 12 tone music and all that? I don't want to do all that stuff. And then I would write something and then I'd immediately think, oh, no, I got that from this. I got that from that. But, you know, everything comes from uh, from something. From somewhere. There's only X I mean, amount of melodies left, isn't there? Or not even well, left. And, and Every melody has been used. And speaking of somewhere, uh, even, you know, like those gorgeous songs in West Side Story. I mean, you know, this. I love West Side Story. That's. One of my absolute favorites is from the the Beethoven. Uh, yeah, uh, is that the is that part of the Emperor Concerto? I think it is. It's the second the slow movement, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah. So he, you know, he did all that stuff all the time, which is fine. I mean, and I think really good composers borrow. You know, great one steel. Is that oh yeah, the that's that fa that famous thing. Yeah. But yeah. it's true, and because it's just so easy to get an idea when you're stuck from somebody else. Um, some yeah, but of my you're not, best... like you're you're taking inspiration from an idea. It's totally different than just going, "I'm going to put that in as a snippet." Exactly. Well, I mean, when you think about it that way, it's as though you're you're experiencing some emotion when you play that piece, right? Mm -hmm. There's mm -hmm. some shade. There's some thing some mood or light or whatever you want to call mm -hmm. it that's moving through you. And so when you use that to write your piece, you're, you've already, you've already got your mood. You already have your way to start. So yeah. rather than thinking of it as like, a, you know, a, a melody, you're really stealing a feeling. That's a mm -hmm. poem. That is a poem as well. I'm going to have to, I, I'm going to make a list, by the way, at the end of this podcast of all the things I'm going to be trademarking and whatever you sell any of this for, I'm getting at least 20% for this. Okay. This is on my podcast. Okay. The money's straight into Gary's pocket here. The poem no, it's, and very, the it's, it's very interesting, isn't it? When you think about it that way. And that is a very different way than, you know, like trying to steal a piece, uh, you know, like on purpose or, or trying to disguise that you're stealing someone's piece that's oh, yeah. always amusing too yeah that, and then the, that you can tell as well you can and then, there are those com out. then there are those composers that have just like almost no ideas like some of my favorite composers i can't stand 
like Kulau most of the time. He did mm -hmm. write a couple of things that are okay. But so much of it is churned out, and it's just I, like, please, could you although, just like... I don't know, like Kulau's music is... It's the same thing a couple hundred times, like literally a couple hundred times for flute, but I, it gets me every time. It's oh, I'm glad great. you like it. Well, some of it, some of it, just, it goes where you want it to go. It just does exactly what you know it's going to do. Well, that's another thing. Comfort. Like, for example, there's the uh, there's this the uh, guitar composer Giuliani, mm -hmm. not our horrible former, whatever. Let's not get into politics. But oh, this not other, him. Yeah. Oh, other, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Hey, Rudy he, he, like he wrote that. <laughs> oh yeah, that's so boring there though. As soon as he hits that part, it's like, could you do something like a little bit more? Oh, it's you think it's like boring I, when the, when the Alberti well, bass comes in? No, when. That's cheesy. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> this part's good. I haven't thought of this piece in like a long time. Okay. I had a funny experience the other day. So I go to the Harvard Club, the gym at the Harvard Club. Okay. And nobody's there at this time of the year. Like I'm literally the only person in the gym some days. Okay. So I'm in there and one of the guys who's at the desk didn't tell me, but he went and he put me in the whatever Spotify thingy off. So my music is playing all over the gym. And he's playing all these favorite hits, but it wasn't like one record. And so one thing started to play, and it's like, what is that? And then I realized it was this uh, Bartok flute and guitar thing that I recorded years ago with Jason Vio. And I'd forgotten completely about the piece, but it was just so funny hearing because, like, wait a second, I didn't write that. What's that? Yeah. And yeah. and then he played some flute and harp piece that I wrote, and I seriously just don't know which one it was. <laughs> I think it was Chimera, but it was just a funny thing to hear all of these things because you know the recordings span like I don't know what, like thirty years of recording. Yeah. But he was playing it in the gym while yeah. you were working on. Yeah. I said, oh, wow, who's the awesome flute player, you know, but but it was just like a funny thing. And then, of course, half of me is thinking, oh, God, if somebody else comes in here and there's this flute music, they're going to just say, what, what? Yeah. Why, where, where's the beat? Nothing would put me off the gym more quicker, quickly than going in and hearing then flute music. Flute? Even yeah. mine? Uh, careful, I'd make an exception careful. for yours. <laughs> Especially for the piece we're writing today. Maybe I can get okay, that in some great. different a few quid. But, um, yeah. I find that I've got so many questions. Actually, can I go back to one thing? I was just thinking while you were composing. If you must. Well. Yes, right. I have the ask. There was a moment where you said, oh, no, that's going to be a 3-2 now. That bar is going to be in 3-2. Yeah, yeah. Is that a choice afterwards? Go no. Actually, no, the weight's wrong? Or did you just realize? You go, actually, no, no I realized after I wrote it that that's what, it, that's what I liked about it was that, oh, no, this is a different it's a different pulse. The pulse changed. Okay. So anyway, that's – see, so then here's my – I don't know what? how much more I can get today, but that's how I can get. That's how I can do that. So that's how I write. So that didn't take too long, right? Yeah, that right. Okay, let's let's talk about this and let's analyze this. First of all, when you were talking about three, two, and switching, okay, the importance of pulse and the importance of feeling. How important is it to you that, like, for example, I don't know, anything that's got three beats to a bar. Why is it three, two is so important as opposed to three, four, six, four? Well, it's just the way the the pulse felt here. I mean, I I I could. It's well, all right. It's an interest. It's a provocative question, because the emotions are freer in three two because the the mm -hmm. beats are longer. Yeah. So especially after all this stuff where I'm stopping, you know. It's kind of like thinking. And then suddenly the feeling takes over, over, but not for long. But here it's back. Nice. Oh, so hey, maybe you. I'll develop this. Okay. And tell me now, so you've done all this on piano. When you go to play it on the flute or you bring the flute line into it, do you think you will change much on the flute or? Let's see. I think it works because the beginning worked. 
Can you curious see me? What, yeah, got you now, yeah. What are you curious to? I'm curious as what what does it mean to work on the flute and to not work? Not feel like crap. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I feel like that's subjective because a lot of things feel like crap for me in the flute. But... I go somewhere like that. Okay, so right, so I'm assuming then you're happy with how that sounds on the flute. Are you going to tell me you're not? No, I'm not. But what I'm going to ask is: Is there ever a time where you've done this where it doesn't sound good on the flute? Yeah, well, you know what? I learned a lesson a long time ago. It's why I always have the flute with me if I'm writing a cello piece, if I'm writing a clarinet piece, whatever I'm writing. I always use my flute. I always have a solo instrument because it's not the same as the piano. First of all, there's no pedal. Yeah. Secondly, there are the vagaries of of register changes. Um, yeah. I actually had a problem with my internet today in the flat, so maybe that's it. The entire of Cologne got their internet knocked out today for 20 minutes. Oh, the entire cool. city. Oh wow! I was yeah, in which... Cologne. I was in Cologne one time. Oh yeah. Yeah, I I had a tour with this. It was called the Westdeutsches. Symphonian or something yeah, like that. Yeah. And the the conductor and the woman, his girlfriend who was running it, she was so mean. <laughs> I I was playing Mozart concertos. She was English. Ah, uh, well there we are. They were pissed because they were offered the choice of me playing or the conductor playing the piano and doing a Mozart concerto and they all the all the venues oh you froze again. Oh. Uh oh. Maybe it's a power thing. Can you hear me now? It's still, can you hear me at least? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. You okay. stop. You, you stop. Anyway, so long and short of it is they refused to bring down their pitch for me, and I had to play at 443 on a 440 flute. Oh, yeah, because Germany used – I think a lot of German orchestras still play at a 443. Yeah, well, it was not my idea of fun. And uh, anyway, long story. Long time ago. Who cares? So, um, oh, I listen – the woman who – I love this woman, Cindy, who helps me out with my stuff. Yes. She told me, I must tell you that I'm posting new pieces of mine all the time, or she's actually doing it on the Shocker she Shop, is. Yes. which is on the GaryShocker.com site, which we revised. Yeah. And she, she told me I just needed to get with it and update my – You absolutely old, do. Yeah, poor, it's good to website. see this. Yeah, yeah, and you're getting a, there's a lot more videos of you coming up as well with your new compositions and stuff, which I'm delighted to see. You're becoming well, she, a bit of a pro with this as well. Well, she does a lot of it, but the idea was to get, um, you know, put up backing tracks so that you can hear me play the piano parts. So you know what I want. You can play yeah. along with it, and then you can also hear the whole piece. And you can, you know, the thing is, I've published a lot of music. I've actually, mm -hmm. you know, I published more than anybody else. Yeah. <laughs> and um, but. My current, you know, I've been mostly with Theodore Presser and they're just not publishing as much flute and piano stuff. So I I just thought, well, okay, well, fine, I'll do it myself. Well, the thing is, if I publish it, I collect almost 100% of the funds. And if they publish it, I get 10%. Yeah, yeah. So there's no money in it except for, you know, commissions or uh, like orchestra performances and things. So it's actually better yeah. for me because it helps me pay my copyists because I do this. I, this is how I compose. I don't use a computer. I do my pencil. You never use any notation software, no? No, no, I don't. I don't know how and I don't care. I don't want to. I'd yeah. rather do other things. I'd no, rather bake. Don't. Yeah. yeah. That you should definitely be baking as opposed to be sitting fucking Sibelius for three hours. As 100%. Exactly. But it's cool that you're doing that and going straight to the customer. I think that's the modern, the way the modern uh, media world is changing and artists especially cut out the middleman. We're just selling our products directly to the people that want to buy it. It's a great market for that as well it's, now. I think it's probably 
true. And I, I mean, the, the nice thing about uh, the commercial publisher for a long time was they had all these dealers that would automatically buy a new. Yeah. So if I wrote a new piece, I'd sell a couple hundred copies the first year. Straight away. Yeah. And I think all those dealers are gone because there's no stores anymore. No, and I suppose people are discovering new music as well through the internet. They're finding videos, mm -hmm. they're finding recordings, going, "Oh, I want to play that," and that's where it sort of goes. So, may as well use it. So, and there's yeah. all, all so many people that write me from I don't know Russia or from the Philippines or whatever, saying, "Oh, could you please send me the piano part for Regrets and Resolutions or something?" And it's like, "Well, no, I can't. First you of all, legally, it. I'm not allowed to, and secondly, why are you so cheap?" Don't you yeah. think I just don't you think I deserve to get paid for what I do? Exactly. But people yeah. are amazing that way. They just kind of think it's all like because you can hear it or see it on the internet, you're entitled to own it. Yeah, which you're absolutely not. Like the internet's free. You know, Facebook and stuff is free, monetarily yeah. free, but you pay right. for the quality you get. Like right. and supporting independent artists is really important. That's how we do these things. That's how the music gets published and gets more people playing it and gets promoted. And to be honest, when you're buying a piece of music, it's not that much money. It's no. a couple of quid. You can afford yeah. like 15 bucks to go and buy a piece of music or 20 bucks to buy a piece of music. Something that you will have for life. Like I, I use a lot of sheet music on my iPad when I'm practicing, but mm -hmm. I always buy a physical copy. One, for performing, and two, it's just nice to have. Like I dig through the music and I own the copy. It's there. It'll be there for my whole life. Unless I spill coffee on it, which happens quite a lot. Uh, <laughs> a new one. But apart from that, I've got a beautiful copy of the Eber Concerto where I spilled red wine on it. And it looks so artsy. And it looks gorgeous. I'm very proud of it. So I've, I've got to keep it. I might start spilling red wine and things in the future. But you're buying a copy for life. That's it. And it's a great thing to have. You can write your name in it. You can pass it on to people. It's a, it's a physical thing. It's an artifact. Right. And plus, you're, you are supporting the people well, not so much Ibera, but you know, if you buy a piece by a living person, you're supporting that person, and you're also letting them know that, okay, there are people out there who really connect with what I do. I'm not just, yeah. you know, I'm not just up here writing things down to stick them in envelopes. And I mean, I've got yeah. so many envelopes full of music that I just have never published. I mean, I've got hundreds of pieces that I are know. just. Sitting sitting in the library you know because I, I know. it's like i can't i can't put everything out no I okay don't, everything you know have you got a do you ever get fan mail the like actual physical fan mail still or is that a thing that's gone like, do you ever get letters from people or um occasionally not physical letters not in a long time did you I, used to I get, get them yeah people would send me things but mostly i get uh you know, like people comment on my stuff or you know how it is. Mm -hmm. Everything is just like a quickie now. It's like I know a yeah. heart a heart on your you know, you, you write in you write a new piece like a beautiful thing and you put it out there and somebody puts a thumbs that's up it. next to it and that's <laughs> that's it, you know? I know it's ruthless in the no, it's ruthless online. Especially Facebook, it's ruthless these days. Well as, you know, as as Cindy points out to me, it's like people just it's all just there's so much competition for attention constantly. Exactly. But then a certain format change that like I find with the podcast, for example, because it's a long format, the episodes are forty five minutes to an hour long you don't get as many hits as I would a viral video on Instagram. It does drive me mad sometimes when I see someone play like 30 seconds of the Godfather theme and like half a million people see it. But I'm like, yeah, my podcast doesn't get half a million people watching it, but it's attentive. It's 45 minutes. People are watching the whole episode. They're invested in it. And there's a much deeper connection with people as opposed to, oh yeah, that's funny. Straight on to the next one. Away we go. Well, you're very good at this, I must say. I mean, you ask good questions and you're interesting. And also oh, you, 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 um, mm -hmm. You're you're able to go with the flow. I like the fact that you don't have a script for this thing. You can just me kind too. Of this is fun about. today. So, what else do you want to talk about? Ah, oh, about the composition. I want to talk about everything. But there's two questions straight away that come to mind. One, we were talking a little bit about transposing the melody and playing it on the flute, and I asked you, is there times when you're ever not happy with it? Is there is it technical limitations to the flute, or is there certain things, I mean, specifically flute, or the things you go, that just doesn't work on the flute, beyond the ridiculous, like I'm not talking like bottom C trills or anything, but is there anything you just go, mm, that just isn't very flutey? Well, I mean, I've been doing this for a long time, so I I'm kind of already know what's going to work and what's not going to work. Okay. Um, I kind of know where... I mean, it's really nice to write for flute and harp because you can write anywhere on the harp and not cover the flute. Whereas uh, uh, that's why, okay. So you can write yeah, higher notes, lower notes. 
you can kind of be anywhere fine. you want even uh, but but on the piano you got to watch out for covering and i mean there's so many great things like i mean i mean as much as i love the mozart flute quartets they're just i mean it's kind of like being you know submerged playing those things because you're in the same range as all those other instruments that are yeah. so much more you know so it's always a yeah. challenge not to to push i remember i i was once playing them and i asked my I studied with Julius Baker and I said, well, how do you deal with that? And he said, just, he said, when you have a rehearsal, just say, Hey, do you think you could, could you, could you just like play a little bit softer? Cause I, I'm afraid I, I can't, I can't make enough power to, to be heard. And then he would play really soft. <laughs> so Not that, good. and so that, you know, they would come down because a lot of times they just don't get it. But, you know, the flute, the, the flute in, in those ranges is not very thick. Probably on a, on a Mozart era flute, it was thicker. Oh, do you reckon? You know? I thought it was the opposite. I thought no, the Mozart era like flutes Baroque, were weaker. No, no, but the, the Baroque flutes are much more, they're much, uh, uh, dare I say, ballsy on the yeah. bottom of the, of the sound. True. Yeah. And there's a color to them as well that is very, there's something about them that speaks in that register. Absolutely. When they speak, they speak well. When they don't speak, yeah. they really don't speak well. But... Yeah. Right. But well, yeah. so yeah, so I, I just you know I just pay attention. I think when I get an idea, and also again, I I think it's really important if you're asking me for advice for a composer, to make sure you have a solo instrument that you can play along with whatever else is playing with it, so that you're not yeah. just writing piano music. Because for example, all right, if I if I here's an idea for a bad flute phrase. Uh, Go. Let's see. Um, this I would love to hear this. Um, let's see, um, it's a bad interval, D to F sharp. So if I do that, it's going to be a lot of work for me to make it work. So if I move it up. It's still okay, but here. Yeah. You see, the higher I go, the more it changes and it becomes more beautiful. But down here, well, I would never do that. Like, okay. especially, I don't have a low B on my flute, so I couldn't go to the C flat there. But, oh, yeah. you know, so just kind of getting used to that. And then also, I don't think flutes do really well at individual notes. Like, toot, toot. Like, okay. Some, okay. some, like, some, like, some of the stuff, like, in the. I'm trying to think of an example of that. I know well, what you mean. Beethoven, Beethoven's, uh, like, he wrote a lot of flute music that's just like his Terrible. flutes and not flutes and not. It's just not that no. comfortable. No. It might again, it might be more comfortable on, a, you know, a big wooden flute from that era. Uh, or even a violin. But to be honest, like, I love Beethoven, my favorite composer. The Beethoven flute works are disappointing to say the least. There's a reason we don't play them. Yeah, they're they're difficult. Um, they're, not, they're difficult. Yeah, it's not great by them. But then, also in terms of keys, do you think there's certain keys that suit the flute better? Because I've always felt like this when I play. I love playing in E flat F major, major. Not so much A flat major. I love. I love the flat keys, especially when we get sort of three, four, five flats. I love them. G major. Hmm. I think a C major. I think is awful in the flute. I think it's a key C that just major. doesn't work on the flute. Yeah, I never enjoy playing in C major. I think the color is not right with the flute. Uh I, I, I guess, I mean, but the thing is the Mozart flute and harp concerto is one of my favorite things. So it's yeah, in C major, okay. but, but I, I know what you mean. There are all those E's that you have to get around. And then the yeah. thing is though, I mean, I'm assuming you grew up on a modern scale flute. Mm -hmm. So your D flats and C sharps are more in line in tune than mine. I have to always watch the color on my, on my C sharps on an old scale flute because they're uh -huh. hot. Yeah. Okay, so do you, do you ever put the right hand on a couple of fingers to cheat, or do you just no? Actually, okay. Not really. I use my right hand though sometimes 
uh, it's very helpful for some technical passages. Yeah. To add yeah. to add fingers in the right hand. Um, yeah. Uh, but uh, like, oh, what's that one? Somebody was asking me about that. Oh. Uh, uh, where was, somebody was playing syrinx for me the other night in my class. Ah. Um, oh yeah, that's the other thing. I'm plugging. I give a monthly master class online, so check that out too. Because last time we had somebody from Australia, Japan, Colombia, and a bunch of Americans. Wow. Canada, so in Canada. Ah, don't feel Canadian. Yeah, they really hate when you forget them. Um, but like online, like a Zoom thing, so someone plays and we can all just watch. Yeah, yeah, I do a Zoom class and um, all levels. I really like teaching people that uh, have problems because then I always figure stuff out for myself. Yeah. It's like, I, you know, what happens is like somebody will be playing in my class. It, it's inevitable. And I, I really kind of go in feeling like, okay, I know what I'm doing. And then somebody will do something. And it's like, why are you doing, why are they doing that? And then I realize, oh, I do that sometimes. And it's ah. not helpful at all. So, it's all, you know, it's all a big learning project for me. I just love to teach because it's the way I improve. All right. Have you got any examples of when that happened? When you saw someone else doing, oh, I'm doing that as well? Yeah, yeah. Examples? Like, like um, let's see. Well, I mean, there are all sorts of things people do. For example, the tongue really is not supposed to be used for volume. Okay. In what and what sense? Well, people push the tongue. They think they're going to, they think they're going to be, I'm freezing. I got to turn down the AC. Wait, come with me for a walk. Oh, I'm so, that's one thing. I've just got back from America a couple of, like two weeks oh, ago. Oh, well, that's not America. That's Texas. That's different. Yeah, I need to get away from the AC. The AC was killing me. You, no, I know. Like, no, no, so it, it wasn't outside. even Texas. It, it was the, ho it's the land of hotels. You know, it's like anywhere you go, the hotels yeah. are just too cold. They're but, freezing cold, man. You see, the thing is, my room is up on the top floor of this building, and so it's it's it the extremes of of uh, temperature are big. So I have to be careful because the of the instrument to keep the uh, humidity. So the hu the AC keeps oh, the yeah. humidity. Yeah, yeah. Last time I saw you, we were in Harlem. No, I didn't go to Harlem. I went to where did I go? Yeah, we were in Harlem. I remember sitting at my harpsichord in Harlem in that orange room. Oh, yeah, of course. You've moved flat. I forgot about that. You've moved. Yeah, obviously. yeah, we moved because, well, what happened was my next door neighbor was a real. <laughs> he decided to sublet his house as an Airbnb. Oh, God almighty. And so then we'd have like 25 people, I counted one time, staying next door. They were playing beer oh, pong that. in the back. We'd be in the dining, in our beautiful dining room, nice and quiet. And there's all this screaming, loud, laughing crap. And, you know, it's like just the worst. So, yeah, I, I tried. And, you know, it's really hard to get that stopped. There's actually an interesting article in the New York Times yesterday or today about, um, now I'm feeling, I'm, I was kidding about Texas. If you're from Texas, I love Texas. I was just being funny. <laughs> but the, 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 I'm not. The problem is endemic, and you know Barcelona. They have people going after tourists with squirt guns, and oh yeah, yeah. Because all these people are just buying properties and then renting them out as hotels, and it's yeah. wrong. Yeah, that's it's right. Really, it's bad Germany for the hotels. Be, it's bad for everybody. It's it's it kills the industry, and yeah, this is why I lived in Germany. Mm. Coming back to Germany was such a breath of fresh air. Because as, as much as I love the USA and traveling across it, coming back to a place where there's like you know laws and protection and socialism and all those mm. lovely things, I'm like yeah. Things are just a bit nicer here. The USA is like the Wild West. If you have the money, you can do it. The USA is the way it feels to me. But I go back to Germany, like, yeah, everything's fine here. Like on Germany, like on a Sunday, for example, you can't use the vacuum cleaner on a Sunday. You can't go to the bottle bank on a Sunday. Sunday is quiet day. Absolutely. And it's in law. And wow. I love that. I love this kind of stuff. It drives you mad when you first move to Germany. And after a while, you're like, actually, no, I love my quiet Sundays now. They're, they're great. Just everything. Mm -hmm. The government just stops everyone. It's lovely. <laughs> yeah, I remember when we were in, in Cologne uh, for that tour and there was just absolutely nothing open. Mm. Um, uh, Which I, I, remember, kinda, I, I love. I just remember having a potato pancake in front of the big cathedral there, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, and I was about to eat it, and this pigeon came down and snatched it. <laughs> Welcome to Cologne. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Do you know the do you know the fascinating thing about the cathedral? So the the Cologne Cathedral is the I think it's the biggest Gothic cathedral in the world still. 
or maybe the second biggest industry mm-hmm. is the one in Boston, of course. But anyway, the Cologne <laughs> Concert Hall, the Philharmonie, as you'll probably know, it's underneath. So, like, when you're at the cathedral level, the cathedral's quite high up. There's a huge, big, like, square just beside it, and underneath is the Cologne Philharmonie, which is a, an amazing concert hall. They spent years building it acoustically, state of the art. But there was one small thing they had forgot, which is typically Cologne, was now when they have a concert, if someone walks along the place at the top, across the square oh, above it, gosh. you can hear it in the concert hall. You oh, can hear gosh. it in a concert. So every time they have an orchestral concert, they have to set security up. They have to pay like five security guards, block it off in the biggest oh, tourist area of the city to make sure no one goes on top of it. It's also a very popular skateboarding spot, which causes a lot of issues as well which is typically Cologne to plan everything perfectly and forget about one small detail. Because you know that oh. detail had to go through like 15 levels of bureaucracy. to get It went from desk to desk to desk and it never really got right. the whole way there. It's a great concert hall, but it's so funny when you see that. You can ruin an entire concert just by walking across. But anyway, I do go back to your competition. Yeah, no, no. You can't, so, yeah, I can't I think... keep dragging me away. You know, it's okay. I think I'm going to have to finish it later because, I mean, I, I'm, I'm sort of feel like it's going to a place now where I'm yeah. going to have to be more inside myself to okay. to do so, it. But you get the idea of what... I do. What, oh. And what I really want to ask now as well is, how do you name your pieces? Where do you get the name from? Oh, I just think about them and I, I um, just... Usually I'll be walking around outside and something will occur to me. Okay. Uh, just something so the name pop. come after? Oh yeah, always after. Okay. Did something yeah. you put a lot of importance into, or are you not really bothered about it? Um, I've written like eighteen hundred pieces, so I mean, I, I I mean, I can't. How creative, you know? I mean, it, everything has its own thing, but you know, I I just kind of I don't want to start. Uh, over I don't, I don't overthinking. I don't like overthinking it. I just okay. kind of wait, and if something just you know presents itself uh, like okay. like i wrote this thing yesterday and i i i think this is it's a three movement piece and i so i i just kept thinking it sounded like um there's this part which is really i just posted it on uh, facebook and it it, it, it it's I got this part where everything opens up and it's very surprising again the 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 uh the motion slows down, so mm-hmm. it becomes more emotional. And I thought, oh, it's kind of like suddenly you're looking up. And so I thought, oh, I'll call it look up. And then I thought, no, I'll call it just look up because the beginning of it is kind of more cerebral, more earthbound, okay. more heady. And then sudden so it's like, but wait a second, if you just look up, look, look what's up there and don't get lost in what's mm-hmm. down here so much. So that's how I do it. Okay, okay. Have you got any ideas so far for this piece, or has that not entered your thinking yet? This thing? No, not at all. Uh, maybe mm. I'll call it something like Gareth sent me. Yeah, the hair. There well, we are. I... Gareth is, is uh, what's that word they're all using now? Gareth is, you know. Demure. Demure is the word that's all over my TikTok at the minute. <laughs> I, if I hear the word demure one more time, I'm going to crack up. If one you of my hear students said time, that to me today. Really? I've never heard the word demure in my life. And in the last week, I swear to God, I've heard it at least 500 times. At well, least. How, no, I'm thinking of another word. It's a short <laughs> word that I've seen on a lot of T-shirts recently. Oh, uh, I, I, see, you're going to embarrass me here as well because I'm 31. I don't keep up with these things as much now either. So you embarrass well, me. Well, you know. Lit's a quite uh, a common one. Fire. Uh... Uh, the Americans have their own ones as well. We don't. It's wait, wait, but it's <laughs> got to be. It, it's it's not like it's like Brad. It's like it's like. Uh, <laughs> uh, it, it's uh, I can't. Think I of know it the I've listeners are going to be it. screaming right now at the the episode of this going. If the, I don't know either, <laughs> someone could tell us. I'm sure. But well, yeah, maybe we'll somebody get... will in, in, inform us. Brat. Oh Brat. Y- yes, yes. Gareth Brat. is Brat. That's because right. of the new album from Charlie XCX, the pop star. She released an album called Brat. I think it's just called Brat, and now oh, it's everywhere. And what does it mean? Is it like I, somebody being a brat, or is it yeah, a good thing? it is just that. I, I honestly don't really know. I don't listen to Charlie XCX, so I don't really know. Well, you and, know what? I don't know who Charlie XEX is. <laughs> 
it's a pop star and okay. not a very good one in my opinion either but my uh-oh, listeners uh-oh. are going to slate me for saying that because uh, she's very 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 popular at the minute but oh, i cannot be doing this brat summer oh i cannot wait yeah. to get rid of brat summer flute summer bring back flute summer bring back demure yeah. summer thank you very much then and have a lovely day thank you for doing this and we will stay in touch oh, i'm going to get you new ones as well i'm going to fix the offset thing and put it in line and send you over some new ones because right, that was a very you. bad mistake on my part. But no, no. by the way, the best photo I've seen out of all the people who got their photos, that photo with you with the the pair. Oh, best one. Wait a Get second. Wait with. a second. Hold on a second. This mm-hmm. is not a perm. This is what my hair used to do. As naturally. I got, yeah, I had naturally curly hair. I used to, have to tape it down. It drove me nuts. I had like a total afro. You tape that down. Oh yeah, because it would like it started out when I was like ten. That just these would stick up, and it's like, what is that? Ah, and then yeah. when you go through yeah. puberty, your follicles change shape. Yeah. And so if they end up going more triangular, you end up getting more curly hair, and if they end up going more round, you end up getting you know poker straight hair. There you are. Didn't know that. Only, I know a only, lot of people that would kill to have hair like that. Only your hairdresser knows. All mm. right. No problem I have. Right. Thank you very much, Gary. We will chat soon. Bye.